Welcome to The Shanae Show, hosted by yours truly, Kavita Shanae. Today we're joined by a South Florida family who had to face COVID-19 head on and are here to share their story. Please welcome Craig and Samantha Hirsch. Thank you guys so much for joining me today. And I think it's so awesome, Samantha, that you shared your personal story on Facebook because I know you're not somebody that posts a lot. I read that and I was totally touched. What were you thinking, Craig? At the time that she was doing it, I didn't know we were separated. I was in the bedroom. I was going through, you know, a couple weeks, obviously, ups and downs and not feeling great. And so I didn't realize that Samantha was recording and taking notes of each day and everything and what the nights were going on and stuff like that. And, you know, it was, in hindsight, it's really nice that she did it. As you mentioned, like, I'm not really on social media. I don't go on often and everything. But what Samantha did was she wanted to document it. There's a lot of family, friends, and neighbors that are seeing all of this stuff on the news and everything. But if you don't put a face to a story, sometimes things seem a little far-fetched. So when she actually did that and people heard the story, it really shined a light on like the case. And I think the picture was so beautiful and so touching, you know, because I had even my experience when my parents came by to see us and and you know, none of us have the virus, but they just kind of put their hand on the door and I put my hand on the door and I'm thinking this is our new normal right now. I was looking back in my iPhone and I look at pictures to see when the last time I went out was and I believe it was March 11th. And that's when you, Craig, went on your ski trip, right? You know, at that time, and it's hard to imagine it now because of the situation that we're currently in in the world in America, but it wasn't like dire straits at that point. And so, did I have concerns about flying and stuff? Yeah, but I think as Samantha mentioned, this was like a, a trip with my friends that I grew up with. We plan it like, you know, once a year and it's amazing that we can even get away. And so we all talked about it. And at the time there was a few cases maybe in New York and Washington state, but that was really it. And we didn't think that going to a ski resort in Denver and especially where you're wearing a mask the whole time and ski gloves and stuff like that. You're really not on top of people that we, you know, contract COVID there. So Samantha, you were documenting the whole time of the dates. So you left on a Wednesday, Craig, you came back on a Sunday, you know, you had been in the airport. So do we know if you got COVID from the ski trip or do we, or do we think we got it from the airport or what do you think? What happened was that Saturday, we were, we were skiing Friday and Saturday. It was just two days. Nobody on the slope. It was a really nice ski day, but uh, <laughs> then we knew stuff was going on. And then we were returning our ski equipment. And then we heard that the mountains were shutting down for good. And we were all like, all right, we got to get back to our families and stuff. We got a message while we were away that day. Palm Beach County was shutting down schools and stuff. So of course I wanted to get back to my family and get back safely. We all left from like different airports and stuff, but one friend of mine and me that were flying both back to Fort Lauderdale, we drove to Denver airport. And when we got there, there was, you know, 45 minutes security lines. There was, after you get through security line, you have to take like transit in there where there was hundreds of people trying to get on trains. And I looked at my buddy and we both kind of just had these like faces on, like, I can't believe we got to go through this right now just to get home. Nobody else that I was on the ski trip with and we were staying in a small condo together, none of them else got it except for me and my friend that went to Denver airport. So we're pretty convinced that we got it in the actual airport or in the airplane on the way back to Fort Lauderdale. The airport was jam packed with everybody just trying to get out of Denver. Was anyone wearing masks? Did you want to put on your ski mask? I had Lysol wipes on with me. Obviously, when we got on the plane, we cleaned everything. I had hand sanitizer that throughout the airport I was using and everything. I didn't have any type of face mask. And not a lot of people in the airport had face masks, like very few. Did you ever contact the airline and the airport about it? No, I didn't. Um, like I said, you know, I was trying... You know, you, I got home and I actually did go and, and work a little bit and I didn't know that I had Corona until days afterwards. I think sometime mid that week and we always try to get our timeline like straight. I had a little dry cough and then maybe not feeling good at night or but you know as Samantha mentioned it was a two hour time difference. 
I had done a lot of traveling that week because I had to go back and forth to New York earlier in the week. And so I thought I was just exhausted. And I think everybody was getting a little paranoid. They're seeing all the stuff online. The second you get like a little itch in your throat, you're like, oh my gosh, I have coronavirus? But you know, it's highly unlikely. We didn't contact like the airline or anything because I didn't know until way later like even telling you the story now that the chances are I probably got it in the airport or, you know, on the actual airplane. So Samantha, he comes home from the trip and obviously you hear about the schools being shut and everything. So you tell him to take a shower, right? When you come home, take off your clothes, all of that. So were you guys sharing a room at this point? That first night was our last night of sharing a room for three weeks. He was on this trip the entire weekend and I was watching the news the entire weekend and he was so far removed, you know, just having fun that I was watching all of these things like literally all day long on different channels. On Sunday, a little bit of panic started setting in and I said, when you get home, you need to strip down and go directly in the shower. But then the next night, a news report came out that said if you had been at a Denver ski resort, or I think maybe even just in Denver at an airport, you needed to quarantine. And mm -hmm. I thought to myself, okay, maybe we need to start sleeping separately. Yeah. How did this scenario work? So then you, like, Craig, you took the bedroom or you took the bedroom, Samantha, and then Craig slept somewhere else? I took over the bedroom. It is like downstairs in our house. I set up my computer so I can do work and stuff from there. And then I also have a door that leads me outside. And so I can get outside and get fresh air from our bedroom to our backyard. And that's what led to the picture with me and my son, Trey. We, um, I was outside walking around and he you know, had seen me. And so we went up to the window glass together. This was a while afterwards and you know, we kissed through the glass and stuff, but that was my way and that was the best setup. And, Good wife, she <laughs> gave up the bedroom and everything. Samantha, how did you guys make this work with you also having to care for your two children? Challenging, extremely challenging. There's so much anxiety between making sure I don't get it and then maybe it's on me and I pass it on to the kids somehow. So the truth is for a good two weeks, I didn't have any contact, like we didn't hug, we didn't kiss. Um, I mean, it's just constant, like changing your shirt, constant wiping down things. It, it really takes control of your life. Yeah, and if you think that like, I purposely kept my distance at the airport, I used Lysol wipes, I did all this stuff, and somehow I still got it, it's super contagious. Then when I come into a household, that sharing air conditioning and everything, like how does my family not get it? We don't know 100%, we, you know, they've been asymptomatic, so we're pretty confident that everybody is good and healthy and it's been a long time already. It's been like over three weeks. And so I'm feeling close to 100%, if not 100%. And so we decided, you know, at least two weeks after I got the positive result, and days after I was showing symptom free that I would finally start going around the family. When you started first having the symptoms, right? You said first it was kind of just tired, you're feeling jet lagged, the dry cough, and then it went into headaches? Yep, I had like really bad headaches. And the one thing to say about this is like, it's not like the regular flu. So you are not feeling terrible 24 hours a day. There were so many days where I woke up I would take a shower, I would feel good, and I'd say to Samantha, I'd walk around the backyard, I'm feeling good, I think I passed this, it's over, and then two, three hours later, you get hit with like a ton of bricks, and you start getting a cough again, you start getting that headache, you start feeling bad, and it was like that day after day after day. Fever was probably like the least of my symptoms, and that's why you know, you hear about all this stuff and is there temperature checks and stuff like that's not going to tell you if somebody has COVID or not. I think that my temperature at the most got up to like 99.9 .9 or sub 100 could have went to, but I wasn't taking my temperature that often. I knew I had temperature and I knew I had the virus, especially because you start putting things together, sore throat, headache, then chills one night, then a fever. And then there was 
Yeah, the typhus didn't happen until like afterwards, but there was a day I remember I was eating, Samantha had made me like an everything bagel with something on it. And I said to myself, I can't taste this at all. Wow. And this was before reports came out that people started losing their sense of taste and smell. I just remember saying to myself, and it wasn't like a stuffed nose. I had no congestion at all with this. It was just like, I couldn't do it. So I went into the bathroom and I remember I took my cologne and I put it underneath my nose and I couldn't smell a thing. Wow. And I said to myself, and I remember telling her, I go, Sam, I can't taste or smell anything for the last two days. And she's like, I just read this article that people are starting to say that this is a symptom of it. And I think it was probably more four of the five days where I had no taste and smell at all. So you piecing all this together during this time at any point, uh, did you call a doctor at this stage? So I called the doctor and at this point we were convinced. We were like, okay, this is like five, six days in, what do we do? So when I reached out to his doctor, they didn't even know how to help us. I was literally pulling up articles and asking them about different antibiotic combinations that we hear of, like on the news and that we're reading about. I had to send them the spelling of these medications. Basically it was, can he breathe? Yes, because if he can't breathe, then take him to the hospital, but do everything you can before going to the hospital. Oh, and don't come into our office. Stay hydrated, take Tylenol, basically play doctor. And then the breathing is obviously the most concerning because you're hearing all these stories and you don't know when, you know, do I make the call myself? Should I be going to the hospital or not? There were a couple nights and it hits you the worst at night where I was sitting there and I had to concentrate on every breath that, you know, that I was taking. So like, like concentrating, just not normal breathing. And then, you know, I was able to calm myself down and not like overly panic, but I could see how people could easily do that. You have to calm yourself down, go with it instead of fighting it. You could freak yourself out and you could start thinking, oh my gosh, and then that even just leads to more panic and heavier breathing. So I did, I sat there and I calmed myself down. I concentrated on breaths until I fell asleep. It was like that for a couple nights. Up until the night that I actually got tested, family member I told us that MedExpress started doing this. So Samantha was calling around. It was late at night, it was probably six. They're like, if you get here, maybe 5.30, if you get here before six, we could probably take him. We jumped in the car, she had a mask on, I had a mask on, she drove me there. It was probably one of like my worst nights or feeling sickness wise. I was having trouble breathing at the time. And so we go there and then we call them and say, we're pulling into the parking lot. And then, so they say, okay. And you see about five or six other cars just sitting there parked in the parking lot and people in their own cars. And then, so they called me about 30 minutes later went over all of my symptoms. I told them I was flying. I had to meet certain criteria in order for them to test me. Then they said, okay, we're gonna give you a call back. And when we do, you need to come to the door. We'll give you a mask and then we'll, so they weren't letting anybody in. And then, so as we're waiting there, we just see one by one people walking up to the door as they're getting the phone call from their car. And like Samantha said, it was just surreal. So probably 45 minutes to an hour later, they called me, they said, Craig, come to the door in two minutes. I come, a nurse comes out fully gar and dressed head to toe with protective layers. They put a mask on me. They brought me inside. They took my vitals They listened to my chest. At the time, they weren't concerned about like pneumonia or anything from just listening to my breathing. They gave me a regular flu test at first because they can get that result in 10 minutes. They came back in 10 minutes and said it tested negative for the flu. So they said, we're gonna give you the COVID test. And then that's when they took, you know, this like, <laughs> this long thing. And they said 15 seconds on each nostril. And you pull the mask down, so it's just like this. And granted, I'm sick. And she's taking it and going 15 seconds and I'm doing everything not to like gag and get sick on her. And it's just, and she kept saying to me, like, you gotta calm down, you gotta calm down, but they are shoving it up 15 seconds and then next one 15 seconds for a total of 30 seconds. I mean, it was a terrible experience. I thanked them for what they were doing because 
they're exposing themselves to people that probably or think that they had COVID. What do they tell you? And how long did the results come in? Seven to 10 days. And I'm like, seven to 10 days? Yeah, while you're in the midst of it. And granted, like I said, I knew I had it. We did want to get like the test results. We wanted to have it documented. We wanted to try to help out the state with getting their numbers accurate and everything like that. And also whether I'd have to like provide that evidence down the road or whether, you know, I'm going to try to get the testing done for the antibodies so I could possibly donate blood and help some people out and everything like that. And so we did want to get a test. I believe it was either seven or eight days later, I did get a phone call and she said, you tested positive. And I was like, you know, it's not a surprise. I was still sick at that time. You can survive this. You can get go through it without going to the hospital. You need to take it serious and you need to protect yourselves. And it's very contagious and you do not want to get this. And obviously some people get it for like two days and they're okay. And some people get it much, much worse They're in the hospital. Unfortunately, people are dying in the thousands. But, you know, we just look at each other and I was very fortunate, although it was a longer ordeal and I was sick and everything like that, we got out of it at the end. Do you ever worry to the point where you're thinking, oh my gosh, like, am I going to make it out of this? There were like two specific nights where one of them, I walked in to the bedroom and the, he had this like look in his eyes. It was like fear. I said to him, like what's wrong and he said to me i can't imagine you feeling like this i don't know what you would do because i have respiratory issues and my son does as well we have asthma to hear that and know that he does downplay a lot of it and he had at that point to keep us calm and then to see the fear in his eyes and how he was like struggling for breath is kind of like, oh my God, like, what do we do? We should really be like jumping from the rooftops that we're one of the lucky ones. The outcome isn't always bad. And you do hear about reports of, of a lot of people that end up in the mm -hmm. hospital. And the sad part about this is they're not allowed to have family friends come to the hospital once they're there. And some of them sadly die alone. That's the scary mm -hmm. part. I said to Samantha, I am not going to the hospital. Like, and I tried. And that's why there's a couple of nights when I just calm myself down and everything. And obviously people need to go to the hospital, right? For certain things. But I, that was like the last, last resort, because like you said, once you go there, you're, you're not seeing your family and everything. And who knows, you know, what happens when you actually go in there and stuff. And so very fortunate and just, you know, lucky. Most people are quarantining at home, healthy. You guys have had this whole ordeal happen. And now you're kind of trying to get back into the regular routine. What's it been like and how has life changed? It's been great that we get to hug and we all get to kiss each other. And that's been like incredibly amazing. And I'm not so concerned with the washing down so much, so many times a day and stuff like that. There is some anxiety on our end because again, we don't know if we were asymptomatic. We don't know if we got it. Hopefully, you know, soon we'll have like the antibody tests and we'll all be able to, we got the virus. Is there anything that you want people out there to know besides anything that we've spoke about? Well, on social media and stuff and on like my Snapchat, people are still hanging out with their friends. Like people aren't taking it seriously. People are like, oh, they're social distancing. But then you see them like taking pictures together and stuff. We want to get like this virus to calm down so we can like, go on vacations and see our friends, then we should be social distancing. I agree. Totally. You can't be hanging out with your friends and then saying that you're quarantining. I know that we are all cooped up inside. I know that like kids can get annoying and husbands can get annoying when you're not with them, used to being with them all the time. But honestly, enjoy every second of the time that you have with your family because <laughs> there were a lot of um, emotions um, that have gone on over the last three weeks uh, that I don't wish on anybody. At the very first, I didn't want Samantha posting this. I didn't want people knowing I had it and stuff like that. But, you know, in hindsight, I'm so glad she did. And everybody was very respectful for it and concerning. And people had ordered us meals and just done a lot of stuff. And it just shows you 
you know, what good friends you have and how good the community is and everything like that. And so it's been, yeah, it's very been nice. very nice. Thank you so much for coming on and talking to us. Thank you. Yeah, Thank you for having you. us. Thank you.